Hi, in this video I will show you this control loop demonstration model. The goal here is to control the speed of the wheel to be what we want. To achieve this, we will use a PID controller. First, we will take a look at what components we are using and how they are connected. This diagram shows the main components in the system. In the bottom, we have our physical system. This is the flywheel that is connected to the motor. The three devices above the flywheel are devices that are interacting directly with the flywheel. It's the motor, which is giving the flywheel speed. It's the encoder that is measuring the position of the flywheel. And we have the brake force sensor, which can measure the force used for braking. The motor we are using is a normal DC motor made for 24 volts. In this model, we are only using 12 volts for driving it, but that's good enough. We are controlling the motor speed using PVM, so we are able to give a continuously signal from 0 to 100%. The encoder counts the notches on the flywheel. It actually has two built-in sensors inside, so it is able to also determine the direction of the movement. The brake force sensor is a load cell that is pushed down by the shaft when it's used for braking. So that way, we also have a way of determining how much force is used during braking. The signals from and to these three devices are sent to a microcontroller, and this uh, microcontroller communicates directly with LabVIEW through a USB cable. Inside LabVIEW, we place the PID controller, which is responsible for maintaining the correct speed on the flywheel. A normal control loop looks like this. To the left, the set point is applied. This is the value that we want the process to have in the end. The process value is then measured by a sensor, and the control error is then calculated by subtracting the sensor value from the set point. The controller function can then use this to calculate the new control signal that it will send to the actuator to try to affect the process in the correct way. Our control loop is similar to the cruise control of a car, where the speed of the wheels is uh, the process that we want to control. In our case, we have a flywheel, and the speed of the flywheel is measured by the encoder. The measured speed is then subtracted from the set point speed that we need to supply, and we use a PID controller for calculating a new control signal. The actuator, in our case, is the motor controller, which will give power to the motor. Finally, I have marked the process as the flywheel. You may notice that I have not included the force sensor, and that's because it's not necessary in this control loop. It can be used to compensate for disturbances, or we can use it to estimate the braking force I make with my finger by using a Kalman filter. But this is a more advanced topic and I will not cover this now. For our controller, we are using the PID advanced block inside LabVIEW. The functions we are going to use on this block is the set point, the process variable, we will also set the P, I and D gains to tune the controller, and finally we need an output. When everything is hooked up in LabVIEW, it looks like this. Now, let's connect our system to the computer. It shows up as a COM port, so we need to specify the right COM port and set the correct baud rate before we press start. Data starts flowing in as JSON messages. The data is shown in several plots. The angle is shown in the circular indicator down to the left, and its speed is shown in the chart in the top left. The force can also be measured using the force sensor, as you see. Finally, we can do a test on the motor and set a manual output to the motor controller. It runs as it should, and it's able to run at uh, several different speeds and in both directions. The problem with using manual output is that our speed is not on the set point. An additional problem comes if I break the wheel with my finger. The speed will vary depending on how much I break. Ideally, we want to compensate for this braking so the speed will stay constant. 
and that's why we are using the PID controller in the feedback loop. Now let's switch over to using the PID controller by pressing the auto button. The controller should now bring the process value closer to the set point at 2600. We see that the red line is getting closer to the white set point line, so this clearly works, but we have a lot of oscillations. These oscillations comes because our PID controller is not tuned. Currently, the PID parameters are 0 0.5, 0 0.002, and for the D term, we have set 0. So here we need some adjustment. I then did a random guess on the parameters, but then it went a wire. After reducing the gain quite a lot, I got back to something that reached the set point in the end. After some more tests, I finally got something I was happy with, and I think this shows a really nice behavior. After a set point change, the speed gets back to the set points very quickly. We do have a small overshoot or undershoot that could have been removed by making the controller action slower, but I don't think it's worth it. There are several tuning methods that could be used to find better parameters for the PID controller. For example, the Ziegler and Nichols method, or the Skogstad method, and also the good gain method would be good alternatives here. But in this case, I think the results we are getting with the trial and error is good enough. Now that the rotation speed is controlled by the controller, we can introduce a disturbance to see how the wheel will react. As you see, the disturbance will first slow down the wheel, but the controller detects that the speed is too low and will compensate. This is the circuit diagram for the device. Everything except the power supplies is drawn here. The 5 volt power supply is connected here and the 12 volt is connected here and here. And of course all the ground wires are connected together. In the top left corner we have the load cell with the 4 wires that goes to the strain gauge amplifier. This is supplied with 12 volts. It sends out an analog signal of 0 to 10 volts. And to prevent uh, that from damaging the Arduino, I've put in a center diode here that will clip the voltage and prevent it from going uh, higher than 5 volts. So that's uh, what happens here. The Arduino gets uh, signals from the encoder. That's uh, the typical quadrature encoder signals, and that's why there are two inputs on the Arduino. The nice thing about this encoder is that it runs on a voltage from 5 to 36 volts, so it's uh, really nice for using with an Arduino. Finally, the motor controller is uh, the typical uh, you will get on AliExpress, used in a lot of Arduino projects. And this is very convenient when you have a 5 volt control signal and a motor running on 12 volts. So that's why I'm using this. I can also mention that the ground wire from the wall socket is also connected to this ground. Inside the box, everything is hooked up according to the diagram like this. The exact names of the components used can be found in this list. That's it for this video. Thank you.